Well, good morning, and it's good to be in God's house. And for all who are now watching us uh, by Facebook this morning and also by YouTube, welcome to the worship service of Chunky Baptist Church. Obviously, it's a little bit different this morning. Uh, for, a, uh, for a temporary time, we are having to suspend uh, our uh, in-person worship services as uh, the COVID cases have really surged in and around and near us. And so I said that we may have to stop and start a few times. So uh, that's, what, that's what we're needing to do. So we're just taking a pause. But as far as our online worship, uh, that, that will continue on unabated uh, by the grace of God. I would remind you of, of a couple of announcements that I need to uh, share. First of all, our Lottie Moon uh, Christmas offering is ongoing. Uh, our church goal is 4000 and I would encourage you uh, to give as God would lead you to give. Just a few numbers I would throw out. Uh, in last year, about this time, we had 535,325 3, uh, people who heard the gospel message that was made possible by Lottie Moon. 827 people groups were engaged by the International Mission Board through Lottie Moon. 47,929 people were baptized. That's using Lottie Moon. 12,368 new church plants. 33,068 advanced training for people uh, to, to continue to share and teach the gospel uh, to those in the people groups where they live. 214 people groups uh, have a self-sustaining uh, ownership in the mission network. In other words, you're not just dependent on people coming from the United States, but also uh, indigenous people uh, taking and, and continuing the ministry uh, that is established. All that through Lottie Moon. Yes, it is uh, 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 an offering, but it's not just dollars and cents. We have the opportunity to touch lives. Also, would encourage you that while we are um, temporarily paused in terms of our in-person worship, but please continue to uh, mail in your tithes and offerings uh, to the church, uh, that, to Miss Cherry. That will be greatly appreciated. So those are the, the two announcements that I needed to share with you. Uh, also, a big thank you to everybody who is continuing, who has been praying and is continuing to pray uh, for my grandmother and for my family. We have other uh, prayer requests and such, and I would ask that you would remember them in prayer as well. But I just wanted to take this opportunity uh, to tell my church family and all who are uh, been involved that prayer changes things. So thank you so much, and please continue to pray. Uh, Brother Roger, you have an announcement. Good morning. On behalf of the deacons, we would just like to make you aware of, and keeping with tradition, even though we're not going to be on site, uh, the Christmas envelope that we normally provide for Brother uh, Charles and Brother Gary, we would like for you to uh, send those in, if you will, to the address to Miss Cherry that's on Facebook, or you may also send those to our church P.O. Box uh, 98 here in Chunky or you may contact one of the deacons or stop it by one of the deacons' uh, homes and drop those off. And we would request that those be made or delivered to us or co contact us to pick up uh, at least by next Saturday. We would like to get these uh, to Brother Gary and Brother Charles by next Sunday morning, and I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. Christmas time, and so we've got several good Christmas songs to sing today. And the first one, we're going to get Brother Charles to sing. Oh, gracious King, 
two Christmas songs, each about the manger. The first one is Away in a Manger.
Gracious Father God, we thank you for the beauty of this day. We thank you, Father, for the beauty, the mystery, and the meaning of your love, and especially revealed in this Christmas season. We thank you, Father, for answered prayer. And Lord God, we thank you that you use prayer, perhaps in ways that we don't fully understand, but Father, you use it, and you invite us to be, uh, Lord, with you in, in your work. And prayer, Father God, is that key to catalyst. So, Father God, we pray then this morning that you would speak to our hearts. Father, that your word would ring loud and true in our hearts and our lives. Father, on these airwaves. And then, Father, may we live the truth as we know and love the truth. Lord, that our lives might be a, an example and a light, Lord, shining in the darkness of people's lives this Christmas season. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. In England, an elementary school teacher allowed her students to create a nativity scene in the corner of her classroom. They had a model barn, they had real straw, and obviously clay figurines for all of the characters, and including the animals. In the middle of it all, there was a small crib with a tiny doll, that represented Jesus as the Christ child. Once it was finished, one boy was troubled by it all. The teacher sensed that there was a problem and, and asked the student, what was the matter? And with eyes glued to the crowded scene of that nativity, the little boy exclaimed, I just want to know where God fits in. Christ wants to fit in to our lives, Christmas and beyond. We'll be looking at numerous texts, but Luke chapter 2 verse 7 will be our primary text that I will refer to. Christmas 2020 is an unusual holiday season to say the least. That's an understatement probably. There's the usual desire to be traditional and sentimental and, and memorable and, and to have uh, time with family and presence and good food. And there's the need for social distance concerns, COVID alerts and caution everywhere. And in the middle of it all, making the time and experiencing the meaning of Christmas. Indeed, where does Christ fit in? At Christmas. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 7 in the New King James. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place when Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went down to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them. In the end, we will revisit this passage as we go through the remainder of this Christmas season, but I want us to focus on the idea that there was no room for them in the end. No room. That's a double-edged sword, is it not? On the one hand, it's cold, hard, and callous. There's no room, no vacancy here. Keep, keep moving. On the other hand, when you consider all the needs that Mary would have, 
And I won't go into all those uh, details, obviously. And there is that one room which is the manger. In our vernacular of today, we would say he was born in a barn. All right, well, but that was actually perhaps an act of grace and mercy on perhaps the, the part of the innkeeper. We're not told who provided uh, the, the manger. Maybe it was the shepherds that they had uh, seen as they came into Bethlehem. Maybe it was a bunch of people that God used. I don't know. But I know that there was room in the manger and it had made all the difference. The manger is where heaven and earth intersect, if you will. The birth of Jesus. He was royalty born in humility, but in a humble and holy stable. No room in the inn, no room in the palace. And I fear that in many people of 2020, no room in their heart and no room in their life. Where does Christ fit in at Christmas? Because he wants to fit into your heart. He wants to fit into your life. So today we look at the fact that there was no room back home. There was no room for them. Luke chapter 2 verse 7. Politically a census has been ordered for the purpose of taxation because Rome needs money to maintain the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. It's the equivalent of having federal taxes today. Every April 15th, more or less, is always a fun time. Woohoo! Okay, uh, Not to mention your local taxes on top of that. And yet uh, Galatians 4 says that in the fullness of the time, uh, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born of a virgin, born under the law, to redeem those who were also born under the law. In other words, God was directing the hearts and minds of the leaders of the Roman Empire all the way up to the emperor himself of it is time for a census and a, a unique uh, situation is not just showing up to be registered at your local government uh, headquarters in your hometown, but going to the, to the town of your ancestors. If that were happening today, if that was part of the U.S. Census of 2020, then I would have to go to Canton, Mississippi. That is my ancestral. That is where I was born. Uh, that is where members of my family before me were born. Or, if we really want to uh, get you know, a little further back from that, I might have to go to Philadelphia in Neshoba County. Or find wherever the ancestors came from, from South North Carolina. Or, if I really wanted an overseas trip, Denmark, 1591. Uh, that's when the Moors eventually left that part of Europe uh, to uh, heading ultimately to England and Scotland and Ireland and from there to the States. In other words, I'm glad that we don't have to do that extreme. But that was the setting and for Joseph, that meant that Bethlehem would be the place because he was of the royal family line of King David. And therefore, although he's not the biological father, and, but he is the adoptive father. He is the legal father of the as yet unborn Christ, who is king of Israel. He's also the king of the world. He is the son of God, but he's the son of man. And therefore, Bethlehem is going to be that place that has a date with destiny. There was no choice. You didn't say, well, you know, I just don't feel like making that trek. It's going to be uh, weeks to, to get there, and it's going to be hard. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie The Nativity, I, I would encourage you, if you never have, to Google it sometime, watch it, stream it, whatever it is uh, that you need to do. It's a, it's a very fair, I think, representation of what it might have been like. It was, a, it was a trek for them to go to Bethlehem. But in a prophetic sense of the term, there was no room for Mary, no room for Joseph, and no room for the unborn Jesus in Nazareth. They had to go. It was required by law. They had to be on the move. Mary, uh, during this time, is looked with suspicion and disapproval, betrothed yet expecting a child, Joseph is not the biological father, and I suspect that in any small town anywhere, that was quite the scandal, although there was no scandal because Scripture tells us that uh, the child that she bore was of the Holy Spirit, was of God, and therefore without sin, a genuine, bona fide miracle, and yet I suspect she bore the brunt of gossip and criticism there was no room for them in Nazareth at that time. 
talk of miracle conception was probably discounted. And yet Joseph married her anyway because he loved her, he loved God. It was not an easy time and would not have been an easy time for the couple back home in the village. So the departure for Bethlehem may have been the break that they needed. There was no room back home. God used the political and the personal climate to bring about this move. Mary and Joseph, he moved them to the right place at the right time to fulfill the prophetic scripture. But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from of old, from everlasting. Micah chapter 5 verse 2. No room for them back home. So how, that, how, how might that apply to you and to me this morning? You know, it is entirely possible that one can be so hyped up about the holidays at home that there is no room for Jesus in the home. Does our culture and do our customs actually crowd out Jesus? Where does Christ fit in at home during the Christmas season? Unlike those at Nazareth, will you and I be willing to love others who may be shocking and scandalously different to us, especially in this season? And certainly if we profess that Jesus has his home in our hearts, let us make room for them because God's house is a home. Where does Christ fit in at Christmas? But I would tell you that not only was there no room back home, there was no room in the palace either. In the context of the scripture, David is no longer, or rather his family line, is no longer in political power. Certain Bible teachers state that Joseph was of the line related to King uh, Jeconiah. He sinned grievously and came under God's curse, which resulted in none of his descendants reigning as king. Now some have said, well, that curse was rescinded or, or such. But the point is, is that at the time of Jesus' birth, there was no longer a royal palace for Mary and Joseph to have, and there was no royal palace for Jesus to be born in. It was currently occupied. Herod, Herod the Great, I call him Herod the Not-So-Great, the man was ruthless, dangerous, uh, paranoid, as history records, I believe that he put two of his wives and one son to death because he did not trust them because he thought they might be plotting to take his throne. He was a political appointee of the Roman Senate and had the uh, patronage or the support of the Roman emperor and was made to be the king of Judea, a glorified governor, if you will, but he had considerable power, so much so that he was willing to do whatever it took to maintain that power. He, he lusted for power. He clung to power. So news of any type of messianic situation going on that would suggest that he had a replacement was not a welcome sight in his palace. Herod, as we understand it, was uh, from Edomea, which basically is a connection to the Edomites. While they are biologically related to the Israelites because of Esau, they're not part of the covenant and they're not part of the blessing. And therefore, some of the, of the Jews of the time saw him as a, a usurper to the throne. Uh, he is not of the family tree. There were those who prospered under Herod's reign and, and politically and, and financially and perhaps militarily. Uh, he had a lot of things, but he had no room for the Christ, the Messiah of God, in his palace, let alone in his life. Herod desired to be loved by the people, so after he had terrified them to death, then he began a massive renovation of what was known as Zerubbabel's temple. Zerubbabel had been a governor uh, when the Hebrews came back after exile, and they rebuilt the damaged or destroyed Temple of Solomon. It was nowhere near as glorious as the original, but it was a worship facility, and they began to worship Jehovah God. Well, he comes in, and I'm oversimplifying things. There's a lot more history that I could share, but then we don't have two hours. I, I could easily share all that Old Testament history with you, but uh, just suffice it to say, he begins a massive renovation to make it bigger, to make it 
to make it better, to make it awesome. And he succeeded. I'll give him credit on that. In fact, when Jesus was an adult with his disciples walking in the temple complex, and Peter and Thomas and some of them say, Oh, teacher, look at these beautiful buildings. We've never seen anything like this. Have you, what, have you ever seen anything like this, Jesus? I'll tell you the truth. Not one of these stones will be left on top of the other, but will be cast down and trodden underfoot of men or under the Gentiles. Antenna went up because Jesus was speaking of the last days. But that is a sermon for another time. But he was doing that, that, not Jesus, but Herod, because he wanted the acclaim of the people. But there was no room for Jesus with Herod. None whatsoever. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 and 3. Herod searched the scriptures. He used his own prophecy experts. He sought to confirm and to pinpoint the location at Bethlehem, Judea. Having taken biblical geography when I was in seminary, I learned that there was a Bethlehem in the northern part of the country, and then there's Bethlehem of Judea. So the scripture prophecy nailed it down to the very exact location, just like there's a Canton, Texas, there's a Canton, uh, Mississippi, and there's a Canton, China, okay? Uh, so narrowing it down. So Herod is narrowing it down. Why? Because he's not going to allow a rival. Now, maybe he didn't think of it being a, a, a little baby at the time just yet. He might have thought, well, maybe this, this man has been born and he's been kind of uh, under, uh, undercover for a long time. But now, with, because it was such a great expectation of we want the Messiah, we need the Messiah, oh, let the Messiah come. We, we feel that way today sometimes, maybe with COVID. Sometimes I'm like, Lord, then Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus, come and take us now. Uh, not take us in terms of kill us, but rather, Lord, take us home to be with you and the great rapture of the church. But then the Lord may have other plans and say, no, you're going to ride this thing out for a while because I'm going to demonstrate and display my glory through you to other people. So there are times where uh, we have to wait. But either way, in this situation with, with Herod, he may have thought that the Messiah was somehow about to make his great dramatic uh, revelation and that he was going to get followers and they're going to march on the palace, so he's ready. Never thought about it until later that it might be a little baby. You know, how innocent is that? There was no room in the palace, none whatsoever for Jesus, Mary, or Joseph. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 through 4, which you might could say is the apocalyptic nativity, speaking with uh, obviously word pictures and metaphors to describe a very literal reality, spiritual uh, reality, a war spiritual warfare covering the ages in a panorama if you look at the entirety of Revelation chapter 12. Well, Herod was inspired of Lucifer, the devil, the, 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 the adversary, to try to destroy and to kill the Christ child. And when he figured it out that it is a child and not a grown man, he sent his army soldiers into Bethlehem to slay every uh, person, every, every young person, two years old and younger, suggesting then that some time between birth in the manger until they leave to go to Egypt to flee from the wrath of Herod, probably about 18 months. Now that's, uh, that is subjective. Some scholars say longer, some say less. If you watch the Hallmark movies, uh, it all happened on the same night. So I understand, I get it. Um, but the point was, was that Satan was doing everything he could to eliminate the Messiah so that you and I today in 2020 would not and could not have hope or salvation because there was no room for Christ in the palace. How do we apply that this morning? It is very possible for one to be hyped on the holidays 
and yet truly afford Jesus no room in his rightful dwelling place. And his rightful dwelling place is your heart and in my heart. Christ at Christmas for many is the figurehead in the manger scene. And as a result, worse yet, he may become the figurehead over life when he is the Godhead. He is the, he is the authority. He is the very power and presence and person of Almighty God who reigns and wants to reign on a, the throne of your heart this morning. Don't make Christ a figurehead at Christmas. It is equally possible to possess a hardness and even a hostility to Christ amid the Christmas season. Some people love the iconic images of the nativity and little baby Jesus. But then they get hostile if you want to talk to them about Jesus. They, they become resistant if you ask them, well, where does Jesus fit into your life? In fact, where does Jesus fit into your life? That is a question that all of us must answer. And answer it, we will. We have the opportunity to answer it right here, right now, today. And if there's any question, any doubt in your heart and mind, nail it down today. Or one day we will stand before that same Jesus at a great white throne. And we will answer it then, and it will be too little too late then. I urge you, if there's any doubt whatsoever, why not this Christmas... Give yourself, give your loved ones the greatest gift that you could ever give, letting them know, hey, I know Jesus as my Lord. I know him as my Savior. He, he has a place in my heart, and I've nailed it down. Or help them to nail it down. Because I promise you, prayer changes things. Never, ever, 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 and I'll come to this side, never, ever, ever, ever give up on praying for somebody because that last prayer that you pray may be the one that splits it wide open and God does an amazing work. There are times where people are hard and hostile to Christ amid the Christmas season. It may well be that people tolerate no rivals when they are the ruler of their lives. There can only be one ruler. It's either going to be Jesus Christ or it's going to be you and me. In other words, I, either Jesus is my Lord and ruler or I'm the ruler and the master. And if I try it, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to crash it right into the ground. Flame out and just crash right into the ground. That's the best that I can do. I want to do a little bit better than crash and burn. But there are people who would look at Jesus as a rival and not tolerate it. No room in the palace. Unlike those in the royal palace, Will you and I be willing to let Jesus fit in? Even if that means he must take center stage of our life. Where does Jesus fit in? Where does Christ fit in at Christmas? As we prepare to look at our third and final point, one of my favorite Christmas holiday movies, and I have just about every version. That, I just got the most recent one. Well, when I say recent, there's a musical version. It's called Scrooge, where they, it's all singing. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Made in 1970. Uh, I used to tell my 7th grade class, remember guys, if it was made in the 70s, it's got to be awesome, okay? Um, and everything. But Scrooge, or Ebenezer Scrooge, Christmas Carol, whatever version of that, I always liked it. Because it's a story about redemption. How a person's heart can be changed, not by the spirit of Christmas, but ultimately when you read Scripture, by the very spirit of Almighty God. But Ebenezer Scrooge was... He was a money maker and a miser, and he saw Christmas as an interruption, a nuisance. And in the Dickens novel, which I must sadly confess I have actually never read, I have watched every version of it, animated or not, but I've actually never read the book. One of these days I'm going to read the book. But he was a man who was the very epitome of no room in the end, no room for Christ at Christmas. In fact, Scrooge to his nephew Fred said, Every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips should be boiled with his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. Wow. Now that was written in the 1800s, but very unfortunate. It's very true today. A poor excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. It's not convenient and it's not fair. If I was to stop half a crown for it, in other words, take a big chunk of your paycheck, you'd think yourself ill-used. Scrooge, to his apprentice and um, business associate, 
Bob Cratchit. Up until last night, I would have said, I have never heard anybody say Merry Christmas. And yet, last night, as I was in different places here in Meridian, I've been trying to make an effort to say Merry Christmas. COVID or not, pandemic or not, uh, uncertainty or not, political change or not, whatever, it's still a lot to be thankful for. It's still a Merry Christmas, believing, oh, preacher, but what about the grief and loss? Yes, there's grief and loss. But was there not grief and loss last Christmas and the Christmas before that? Is there not challenges and, and fears? Is there not, uh, is there, are there not things that, that trouble us as they now that, that troubled us last Christmas or the Christmas before that? And yet the same Savior then is the same Savior today, the same one who loves us as the song so beautifully uh, described, the mystery of God's love. That same love is very present today. So what has changed? Yes, we have a Merry Christmas. It may be sometimes hard to say. There have been times where uh, I feel the weight of it, believe it or not, of all this. And, and I caught myself one day uh, during my prayer time, Lord, I'm just not feeling the joy. How sad. How sad is that? That's almost me being Ebenezer Scrooge. My humbug, isn't it? You know? No, God got a hold of me and said, well, I can show you reasons to have joy. Scripture, and as things began to unfold in my life and, and things that he showed me, here are the real gifts and here are the real priorities and here are the things that you, uh, what, that you have right now that I provide and that I give. Yeah, you, you've got joy in your life. You may have trouble all around you, but you've got joy in your life. We don't have to be Scrooge. But last night I got to hear people respond saying, Merry Christmas on one or two. I didn't initiate it. They just looked at me as I opened the door and held it for them or as I, I you know, tried to be you know, polite. Uh, at one place I was, I always be polite people, but I mean, you know, Christmas especially. And they looked and said, Merry Christmas, sir. So that kind of changed my illustration a little bit because I said before that I haven't heard very much Merry Christmas, but last night I did. I would challenge us all, why not say this Christmas, Merry Christmas, is it not a way of reminding people that there is a Christ who fits in to their life, who desires to fit in? Let's look at the last part then. There was no room in the inn. No room in the inn. You know, the inn, a hotel, if you want to use our language of today, probably filled a capacity. One time on a family vacation, went to the coast, drove up and down Highway 90, and a sign that I came to loathe entirely was this. No vacancy. Despised it. Of course, it was poor planning on my part, so if I'm going to loathe anything, I should have loathed myself. But we found, we found our inn, and we found room, and it was a joyful time uh, after we cruised the strip for quite a while. But there was no room. Maybe it was filled to capacity, and that no harm was intended. I'm sorry, we just have no room, Mary and Joseph. And especially if everybody's coming in because of a political and financial census that's taking place. So before we're too harsh on the innkeeper, you know, keep that in mind. Maybe the owner did not want, or maybe the owner did not need the bother or the hassle that a special needs couple presented, a woman with child near her delivery date. I suspect from the, from the perspective of the owner, oh, that's going to be stressful. <laughs> And that's going to be a little bit scary. Uh, I'm sorry, we have no room. Sometimes you just wash your hands and you, you don't want to have to deal with it. Then again, perhaps the innkeeper did have a heart. We always, as preachers, we just love to just hammer down at Christmas time the innkeeper. Just get the Bible and beat him over the head with it five times. How dare you not give room to Jesus? But have we ever stopped to think that perhaps, just maybe, the innkeeper might have been the one who said, I don't have room, but I do have a stable out back. I do have a manger cave uh, where uh, shepherds and others bring their livestock because most inns, as I understand it from biblical archaeology, and I had that class, I remember that a long time ago now, sometimes they were one-room inns. Uh, you don't want to be having a baby in a room filled with strangers and that's all I'll say about that so perhaps the manger was actually an act of kindness maybe that there was room in the manger because there was no room in the end it provided privacy it provided a little bit of security rooms that you don't know who's there 
that can take advantage of you. But in the manger, you're surrounded by the animals. I suspect that Joseph had been, was able to find somebody such as a midwife. Uh, that would be a woman that is trained in delivering of babies. I suspect that that would have been the case. The manger, says Dr. John MacArthur, was a feeding trough. Was a feeding trough for the assembled animals. Swaddling clothes were strips of linen meant to immobilize the infant to protect to protect it from scratching its face or eyes. A sign of their poverty, of royal descent, and yet poverty stricken, extreme humble origin. But that room in the manger allowed Jesus to fit in because Jesus did not come for the upper echelon, the 1%. He did not come for just the middle class. He didn't come for those who had some type of uh, connection in life. He came for you and for me. He came so that you and I might be fit in to God's family, whether you're from the top, from the bottom, or anywhere in between. Scripture does not reveal who offered the manger or how that manger was offered. It simply was. But I will say this, though. That manger was provided by Almighty God. As we conclude this, this holiday season, let us be careful not to allow our hearts and minds and lives to be filled to capacity that there is simply no room for Jesus not an intentional harm meant, not even a rejection necessarily, but just simply crowding out the Christ at Christmas. Will you and I make the room available for Him? Even if it means having to evict other things and other stuff from our heart and life. It's possible that we don't want the bother or the hassle, especially in dealing with needing people. What we do to the least we've done unto Jesus. So when we have that bah humbug non-Christmas spirit in our heart, we're essentially telling Jesus, by humbug, I don't have room for you. You're not a priority. God forbid that should ever happen. What we do to the least we have done unto Jesus. Will we be amenable to making time and effort for Jesus, for making time and effort for people in need, as Joseph and Mary and the unborn Jesus were in need, and somebody made time and effort for them, providing them that manger, giving them that room to fit in. Where does Jesus fit in? Where does Christ fit in this Christmas? Does he fit in, into your hope and your envisioning of the holiday this Christmas? Does he fit into your plans for the holiday, for the family, and everything that goes with what Christmas is in your life, in my life? Does he fit into the carrying out of the plans and in a way in which we do them? Does he fit into where, when, and how we will worship and serve him, especially amid the Christmas season, conventional or unconventional? Jesus does not want a soft spot in your heart where you are simply fond of him. He desires the very throne of your heart as king. And you and I yielded to him our life yielded to him. And therefore, by his love, our life is transformed. Be it ever so humble, your heart is the place where Jesus fits in, where he makes his home, until he calls you home to himself. Revelation 3.20, and I close with this. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him, and he with me. May God bless the reading of his word. Christ fits in. He wants to fit into our lives. It is our privilege. It is our responsibility to make the room. Be it ever so humble. Your heart, my heart, the heart of this church family is the place where Jesus fits in. And let us be the, the, the people of God who tell others who don't know Christ, there is a Christ who will fit in to your Christmas, this Christmas and beyond. But that brings us to a very important moment. And while it's a little di bit, I'll try it again, a little bit different worship service than we have been enjoying these last six months, but the invitation is still real because right this moment Christ is calling you to either open the door and invite him in, not that you have lost your salvation or not saved, but maybe you just simply uh, uh, for a while have said, you know, I'm sorry, there's no vacancy here. Uh, there's just no room in, in, in my heart right now. You know, you're not being ugly or hateful. You just kind of got things crowded out a little bit. 
Well, take some of the stuff that's crowding out his room and, and put it out and say, Jesus, here's room. He may be calling you uh, to that, and I would encourage you then to nail that down this morning. Or he may be inviting you and calling you, knocking at the door and saying, hey, let me come in because I want to fit into your life for the very first time so that you may know what salvation really truly is, that you may know what life, abundant and free, really truly is, that you may have the forgiveness of Almighty God that he died and rose so that you and I may have. There may be some other decision. If you are making that decision today, then I encourage you, let somebody know. Let us here at Chunky Baptist know. We will be honored to walk with you, pray with you, talk with you, and help you do whatever it is that you need to do. Let's bow for a word of prayer, and we are dismissed. Gracious Father God, we pause again before you, and I ask you, Lord, that you would help each of us. Lord, I pray that first your word, may, may it go forth, and you would grant your word today success upon these airwaves. And, Father, that you would call to yourself those who you desire. And, Father God, that you would call them, call us all to your word, your worship, and your work this day. It is in Jesus' name we pray. And, Father, help us, especially those, Lord, who love you and know you as our Lord and Savior. Father, help us to make sure that we always are making room so that you fit in, not just barely, that, that you fit in and, and you over, overtake every nook and cranny of our heart and life. For your glory, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. By his grace, go with God.